clock, and we are about to commence our Duluth University yeah. class for today. Chris Blackbar and weathering of styrene structures. Everything you've ever wanted to know about that topic. Please join us in the northeast corner of the store. What do you say? Father, you like me back there. All right, good morning. I see we have the usual suspects here, so I can introduce myself, but uh, welcome to uh, come. Let, let me give you an update on forthcoming classes before I introduce today's speaker. So next week, uh, we've got an electrical by uh, Barry Bastap. We'll kind of be all the, the basics of electrical, but also kind of uh, segue into BCC. So Barry has, uh, I think, a very unique way of presenting that material with lots of uh, kind of visuals and examples. So I would welcome you to that. The following Saturday, we're not having classes on three-day holidays. Uh, yeah, we'll enjoy those three days, so there will not be a class on Friday's Day weekend. But the following weekend, on the 22nd of February, we'll be in our own Gerald Styles. Uh, class on what he calls finishing touches. So you've done your, your track work and your basic scenery and your structures, but now how to really uh, make it pop a lot. And that's what he means by finishing touches. So I can invite you to that. Um, and then on the 29th of February, if you've ever wondered about what layout a man could go with, uh, Detlef Kropanek has actually put together kind of a little model layout of that. So that would be something to take into account. Okay, well, let's get started with today's class. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Blackmar, who has uh, an uh, EMG medical background, and that morphed into uh, tech work with. Uh, HIPAA and lots of the regulations that uh, uh, now apply to that, uh, which probably has nothing whatsoever to do with his main talent. He's known throughout the community here uh, for his skills in weathering. Uh, he can make anything uh, look old and decrepit. Uh, I'm talking about structures, not people. But, uh, uh, so, uh, Chris, you clarified that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I'd like uh, to now let Chris begin and his uh, techniques of weathering styrene because I can tell you, I've always been challenged about how to make styrene really look like, like wood and other materials. And, uh, so Chris, take it away. Okay. Well, again, my name is Chris Blackburn, and I want to thank you guys for taking the time to come and visit me this morning. Um, this clinic is probably going to go an hour to an hour and a half. Is that okay with everybody? Um, okay, over the typical hour that we do here. Um, and this format is not my usual format. 
just to let you know up front, my usual format of clinics that I give at regional shows, et cetera, is typically a hands-on for everybody, where everybody actually gets dirty. And uh, then I focus my uh, clinics to kind of fit the needs of the modelers because different techniques apply to different scales. So one of the first things I need to know is what scales do you guys kind of work in? So if I kind of focus a little bit here. HON3. HO, HO, HON, N. HON3. Okay, so HO, and I don't have any of the super big guys here. Okay, uh, no quarter inch scale. So, all right. Um, well, if that's the case, this clinic is gonna be kind of twofold. Um, the first thing is I'm going to hit you with a whole bunch of information. And the information is designed to enable you to look at the model, look at your modeling mediums, and then try to figure out which applications and which techniques you want to use and where are you going with them. And I'm going to show you some basic ways to kind of get there. Most of it is stuff you've kind of heard before, but we're not going to do the typical, okay, you just scratch the styrene, you paint your model, you come back with a, uh, a black wash, slap that on there, and if it's lucky, you slap on a few weathering powders and, you know, kind of call it good. You can go that route, but um, that's not the, the, the real aspect of weathering to bring your models to light. Um, one of the things you need to kind of consider is that um, the model railroad world is substantially behind military modelers. The military modelers take their modeling skill sets basically from the figurine modelers the gaming modelers, uh, and a little bit sometimes uh, from us, but most of their stuff comes directly from the gaming world and the uh, figurine world. And then they take those things and they apply it to their models. The difference being is that um, in the figure world and in the gaming world, most of their models have lots of bridges and lots of um, points that are highlighted on the model per given. Whereas our models are flat uh, and they have big, long, flat spaces. And in the military world, they're kind of stuck in between two places. They've got big, flat areas, but they've also got some areas that are pretty intensely uh, detailed. So they have that going for them. The other thing that's different uh, is that the gaming world, those models tend to get handled. The figurine world, those models are not handled. Military modelers, their stuff is typically not handled a whole lot. Uh, model railroaders, we've got feet in both camps. You know, our rolling stock is handled a lot. Our structures are not handled. So we've got a different set of techniques that we need to utilize, different mediums that we need to utilize, depending on the models that we're building. Okay? The other uh, thing is that uh, model railroaders tend to use multiple different construction materials. I mean, be it paper, resin, styrene, wood, you know, we use all of those things and we'll throw them all together on a single model. You know, well, how are you going to get that to color uniformly across the model before you go in and start trying to tear it back down to make it look old? So that's a whole different set of techniques that we've got to look at. Um, so... My whole point here is that um, I've spent probably past two years, probably 10 hours to 15 hours a week on average, just going through the military guys, 
and the gaming guys primarily to kind of identify the techniques that they are applying to their models. And then I've tried to modify some of those techniques and bring them into our world. Um, so what we're going to discuss here today is base, the basics of how to take some of those techniques and what they are. There's tons and tons of YouTube videos out there, so I'm not going to go into the fine details of how to do a pin dot or how to do a, a, a filter, but I'm going to give you the basic information to kind of get you going on this thing and the basic information how to look at your model and consider it because the weathering of a model really starts way before construction. So, um, but when you're building your model or when you're contemplating your model, there's three things or four things that you really need to consider. In weathering, always remember less is more. Um, it's real easy to overdo your weathering. So do it like uh, and repeat it ad nauseum if need be to get to where you want. You want to sneak up on things. Come in and think that one, maybe two coats is going to do it. You're going to need seven coats or more. Okay. And, and just bite off on that fact that that's what you're going to be doing. Uh, second thing is patience. Patience is the key to all of your modeling. Unfortunately, it's probably the most difficult thing to master. Um, you know, we could be modeling for 50 years and we're still fighting patience, you know. So, uh, just that's one thing you've got to remember in weathering. If you go in to weather something, you need to give it, you know, more time than what your construction time is. Um, because it's going to take you a lot more time to create that finish. And remember, one of the first things that people see on your model is that finish. Okay, they're going to see roofs, they're going to see finish, then they're going to look at construction. We as modelers tend to look at construction, then we go to our finish. And then maybe we'll think about roofs. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, make use of photo references, uh, particularly if they're colored because you're weathering. And there's very, very subtle things in weathering that we're going to go through here in just a moment. But that's some of the things you need to look at. And then finally, consider your light source. That's really important. Everything uh, from scenery uh, to actually the, the barrel um, in this photo. Consider your light source. You know, for scenery, it's going to be, you know, is it the north side of the building or the south side? Because they're going to weather different on your telephone pole. Is Where's the light source coming from? Where's the weather coming from? Because if you look at a, a telephone pole, one side of it's going to be one color, the other side's going to be a different color. Oftentimes, there's a pretty big contrast between the two. Um, and so if you pay attention to that, uh, your scenery can go into uh, even down to like little streams of water. And when I say stream, I'm talking about the size of a garden hose or smaller. That's all going to have an effect on, you know, the moisture going through there, which is going to have darker area. It's going to feather out into the lighter area that you're going to be doing both with uh, vegetation as well as the undercoloring of that uh, medium so that uh, your soils and things there are all going to reflect through your vegetation and add to the color of things. So you've got to consider down to minute details what you're doing. Now, if you're doing a great big home layout, hey, you're not going to have time for all of this stuff. I acknowledge that up front, and, you know, we all got to acknowledge it. So go through, pick out two or three structures in the area around that structure, super detail it out, pay attention to lighting sources and everything else, and you'll find that people will tend to carry that impression, because they'll focus on that, and then they'll tend to carry that impression through the rest of the layout, as well as in the back part of the layout where things cannot be seen as easily, because your mind thinks, oh, it's done this well, and then it just kind of carries that over. So um, understand that and uh, acknowledge that up front. 
and figure out how much time you really want to spend on going into this super detailed stuff because of model railroad. This, this super detailed stuff is real time constraint, and we need to figure out the difference between the two. Um, the other thing that you need to consider when you're starting out to contemplate a model build of any sort is you need to consider what is the finish that you're after? Where are you going with this thing? Because all of that is going to be built in up front on what you're doing. Say you're doing a wooden trestle. Well, even before you cut that first piece of styrene, wood, whatever, you're going to want to go through and grain it and use whatever techniques you do to add wood grain, uh, knot holes, whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then you're going to go through and do your pre-shading or undershading if you're getting into that type of uh, detailing level. Um, because if it's a creosote type thing, then you may want to come through and add some undercoating that, or underpainings that are kind of a darker in color because that's going to come through your other layers of paint later on. Um, and then you'll want to go through and start your construction. Um, so you need to consider where you're going with it, but you need to step back even one more step and consider just what is it that you really have. So if we look at this kind of model here, and I'm going to start throwing out terms and we'll go through them here in a little bit. Um, I'm going to focus just in on the woods here. And if you look here, um, We've got various knot holes going through here, okay? Now, knot holes, notice that they're yellow with little things in here, okay, the dark spots. Uh, we've got the black knot holes that everybody does. Yellow ones are a little bit more difficult to create convincingly. My point being, though, is these, we can consider these if you're um, doing a metal railroad boxcar or something. This could be uh, basically how you do chipping. Uh, what's called chipping and some chipping techniques where you would come in, you would splatter some, your main paint, a dot of main color, and then you come in later and follow that up with a darker color in the center. And then you would feather out the, the edges. So techniques that you can paint right on, you can paint your knot holes right on to the uh, styrene, um, but you can also use the same basic techniques to apply weathering and chipping and things like that. Um, so we've got that. Another thing, if you'll notice here, is we've got the red streaking going on here and the yellow versus the dark, okay? So is that an effect that you're after? If so, what can we do to kind of make something similar? Here, this could be very similar to a fade so we're looking at a fades, or we're looking at uh, possibly something like rain streaking. So those are two different techniques uh, or two different types of washes and things, uh, glazes that you might want to use. Here's a very large board with uh, some uh, fading on it. Um, so you would want to have a dark fading and a silver fading. But also notice, even within this board, you've got some very light colors coming through. Uh, this is a overall a warm thing because it was painted red at one time, but you've still got that very light red in here. So consider, do you want something that's very old aged looking like this, or do you want it looking like this, where you just can come in and come in with a heavy coat? So you've got to consider this up front because these are going to make a difference on what you're going to be doing in your construction. Believe it or not, your construction's actually gonna fit through and fill this. Here, you're not gonna grain it as hard, uh, have as much texture. And here, you are gonna have more texture. So you've gotta consider up front, what type of weathering am I going after? Here, we've got a board. Um, again, you've got black almost right next to bright, red and then down to a bright yellow. So you've got the black, that's a fade, but look at this, you've got a, 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 a heavy, heavy uh, line going through here, a crack. Well, consider your airplane modelers and some of your military modelers. 
they use a, a pin wash to effectively deal with these type of things. So that's something that you might want to consider in your styrene if you want to have larger type cracks or something that's more visible. Um, so you've, you can do that. Um, and we'll talk about pen washes and things here in a little bit again. This board here would be ideal for, for a filter in a glaze, okay? Because you're doing a fade effect here underneath, but here you've got this warm tone coming all the way through this board. And so you would wanna do a uh, filter on top of your gray colors here to give it this kind of warm hue. Um, so just kind of moving through here, this here, you've got a real heavy uh, line crack through here. You can build that into your model with uh, heavy strokes of whatever, uh, be it a um, knife or uh, uh, a file card or something of that nature. But um, uh, my point here is that you would use a pin wash and then you would come in around it and use uh, a different technique of glazing to add this kind of color here. And then you'd come over and blend it all with a filter. Because if you look right here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a very, very light yellow edge, okay, on all of this. And so instead of applying your filter across the entire board, you just uh, apply it uh, over the red areas here and then come back in and blend it a little bit. And that would help out. Um, this one here, this is construction. You've got uh, other types of uh, indents in the wood. It could be dents or indents in the metal plates or something of a, a metal panel on a box car. Um, so these, notice how they're colored. They're real deeply colored with the base coat in here uh, down deep, but on some of it, it can be below or above um, the, the coat. And so you need to consider what type of in, um, coloring are you going after here? In other words, where is the dent on the metal plate? If it's up high underneath a bridge, then it's probably gonna be something where it's more protected, you're gonna have a lot more of your weathering like this. If it's down low on a car or something, it's, you're gonna have this type of effect. And so you need to look at this. Um, here you've got, I just wanted to show contrast. You've got a single board here, but notice you go from white to black, you've got a thin white, then you've got a red, and then it's fading back out to the blacks and silver white. So these fading and these blendings are all natural in um, nature. This board here represents something that is more painted, like what we would normally just go through and paint our model. Well, notice that your weathering, the heavy grooving and everything else is not as strong on this. The only ones that are really typically there are the very heavy cracks and things of that nature. Um, You've got back on this board a gray effect, which would be weathering. You could consider this a grain effect for like the dirt and stuff on a uh, box car panel or something. Um, but this light grain effect is something that you've got to get real used to doing. And that's done with a glaze. I also want to point out when you're looking at this, notice this board right here. And notice it's painted on the top, but it's totally bare on the underside. Well, are your metals and things of this nature that you're doing on your model, are you looking at that type of thing? Is it a structure where, you know, board and back and how old or new was the structure? Because that is going to reflect it. If it's all painted all the way through, it's going to show something as a more new better maintained type of structure. If it's white like this, it's gonna reflect uh, more of an age structure. If it's you put in a dark wash on the bottom side of this, 
then you're going to end up with a more shadowed effect, which will bring out this board and, and highlight that board more. So uh, then it becomes a matter of, do you want to highlight that board more? And if so, do I want to go in and actually add the different color hues on this individual board on the top? Um, so all of these decisions up front are going to come in play on your model and on the techniques that we're going to be discussing here overall. But you need to be able to apply multiple techniques uh, to come up with uh, a board that looks like this. I also want to point out the use of light because we're going to be discussing a lot about light. And notice this barrel, which is a curved surface. You've got a, a real white going across this area. It's a little bit darker up here, but um, it's because the light source is coming this way, not this way. And then notice you've got three tones down here. You've got the dark tone down below, then you've got a mid-range tone, and then you've got the white tones going through here. And that's all reflective of light. You can do some pre-weathering, which is uh, called xanthan okay, xanthanolical uh, type weathering where if you go through, and I'll cover this in just a moment, but it's actually a three-step process where you go through and prep the model with your coloring even before applying the base coat. And that's all going to, because you're doing your weathering, your base coat weathering, the kind of lighter colors, uh, the or lighter layers, I should say, the undercover, undercoatings are going to come through and give you natural highlighting. So that's kind of some of the things that we're going to be looking at. Now I've thrown out some terms at you and we're going to start going through those terms. But before I move on, did anybody have any questions about this? Because this is basically a review on how to look at a photo and read the photo. That's what I wanted to show you here. When you go through a photo, you just don't, oh, okay, this is kind of red and stuff. But notice you've got the grain, you've got a fade effect. Uh, notice how light changes your colors here. You know, it's, you, when you go through and re look at a photo, read it, okay? And it takes time. It's a skill that's acquired, but you only get that skill from practice. And so, but as soon as you start learning to read photos, it's kind of like putting on an optivizer in your model. Your modeling will just automatically take that next step up, okay? Um, so do we have any questions about reading a photo? Any comments? Feel free to throw stuff in because I'm not the only person here and I learn as much from you guys as anything else. Um, okay. Finally, we need to consider our model when we get it built on its setting. Our, is it going to be a foreground or a background model? Is it, uh, what's the function of the structure? Is it something that's going to be in an industrial type of setting? Uh, is it a farm or is it a bridge? Because depending on which one of those three, that's going to totally set up different types of colors and functions as far as the painting techniques that you're going to want to apply to the model. You need to consider also the material that it's made out of and the, as well as what material are you trying to represent. So styrene is wonderful for representing metal. It's fairly easy to get it to look like metal. Trying to get it to look like stone is a little bit more difficult. Wood is kind of in between the two. The point being though is styrene is very, very versatile and you can utilize it across the board to reproduce anything. You just need to think about reading a photo with whatever that material is that you're trying to get Tyree to represent and then applying the various techniques. Uh, you need to also consider your model when you go through and before you build it. How is the model to be viewed as far as its age? Is it well maintained? Uh, you know, because if it's a new model, you're going to build it with tighter joints. You may not want to have broken boards on it. All of these, again, are weathering things that you need to consider even before making that first cut. Um, 
Finally, you need to consider the final finish that you're going after. Are you going after a basic finish that's just kind of got some chipping? And if I can come over here for a second real quick. Um, I just kind of want to show you this box car here. Notice that we've got basically a weathering process going down here where it's all kind of grayed out. These three panels are kind of grayed out from dirt, dust, and rust. Okay, but look at this panel. Okay, it's real light and it's not covered except notice here, it's got a real dark uh, shadow to it, a dark area. You've got another dark area up here. So you've got dark versus light, contrast. Weathering is all about contrast. Make use of contrast. And that's probably a golden rule that I have not put in there, but you might want to consider it as such. Um, the chipping effects here, you've got a light with a dark center and then a little bit of a, a fade rust or a fade coming down a, a paint fade, excuse me, rain fade type of technique coming down. Here you've got a different, what I would call a filter, because what you're doing is just applying a filter to a little given area, so it would be a targeted filter. Um, up here, you've got this V of white. We're talking very, very subtle. I don't know if you guys can see this or not, I'm making the assumption that you can, but you've got this white V with a, a black, two black spots and a one going across the ribs and the one right up here. Um, so these are all things that you need to consider. You've got lots of little tiny chipping and stuff going across, and you've got some highlighting here, white highlighting here. You've got shadow underneath here. Again, highlights here. But notice these. Um, you've got, I don't know if we can get them, but you've got highlights. The I don't know. If we can't get it, we can't get it. I can discuss it uh, kind of going up ahead. But notice where your light source is coming from. It's kind of coming down at an angle on this, making it so that the tops are light and the undersides are dark. That's something that you want to consider for your layout. Where are your light sources? And, and make your painting of your cars, rolling stocks, whatever, your structures, uh, according to the light. And so consider your light always. Um, Okay, the final weathering finish techniques, you go through and you apply what I would consider uh, your basic weathering, your basic undercoat, your basic um, overall big gross effects such as these here. And then you finally get into some of the other final detail items. Sure, um, and that would be things such as your splatter, mud splatter, and things. And when you do mud splatter, consider the soil colors on the rest of the layout that the car may be moving through if it's a, uh, a car. Um, if it's a structure, consider the soil around the structure. What color is that? Because that's the type of colors, the lighter hues of that, and in some cases the darker hues, are gonna get uh, deposited on the base of the structure. Rust stains, you know, uh, water stains, whatever, uh, how those come through. Um, and you have to consider the use of the mediums that you're using to create those effects. Uh, you might be using turpentine or water to create your, your uh, running effects. Um, so those are all kind of things that you can come through. Other mediums that you might want to be making use of or considering are felt marker pins, and when I say felt marker pins, I'm talking about, you know, things like the Prisma colors. Um, these have both um, a fine tip, and then they've got the broader tips. I don't want to open up. The broader tips, my point being is that you can buy a color like this, which is called terracotta. Don't let the names throw you. It's the color that you're after. This is an excellent marker for creating rust and rust stains and things of that nature. And if I come in and apply this to a coat, as long as it's kind of a glossy coat, that gives me a couple of minutes to come back in and apply 
some solvent to this and create some runs with this marker so I could get my base run coming down with my fine tip and then come in and feather that with uh, some solvent and that'll give you the colors going around the sides. Um, another reason and the reason I have these is for doing something like bricks. Uh, a lot of us are building structures that have styrene brick structures. I'm going to show you where you can go through and utilize these things in making um, different colored bricks here in just a moment. Um, you need to consider um, before you're doing your painting, steel. If you're doing, let's say, a styrene bridge, do you want those steel plates to be just flat and kind of like, okay, that's what they are? Or particularly if some of you guys were doing a little bit larger scale, do you want to show a little bit of texture in that uh, steel? Because steel plates are not totally flat. They've got a little bit of texture in them. So you could take a bunch of uh, styrene solvent, put that on top of the steel plate. That's going to, if you do two or three layers, you're going to get some uh, crusting on that plate. And this works in HO. And then you can come through and on that final layer, you put it in, get the styrene soft, and then come through with a stiff brush and kind of stipple it. That's going to give you some even more texture in it. Then come through and do a fine sanding using, say, a 400 grit and then moving up to a very uh, ultra fine grit uh, and wet dry sand of, say, 1200 and polish that. And then you can come through and start your painting on it. Um, and you're going to have texture in your plates. You could also do this if you uh, wanted to create. Uh, some texture in some of your stonework or something um, brickwork, uh, you can utilize that te that technique. Um, and if you're doing stones, you're going to want to do kind of random type polishing. If you're doing brickwork, you're going to want to always polish in you know a vertical up and down motion. But uh, and it wouldn't be as finely polished because you're going to leave some of that texture. But my point is, is that you can utilize different uh, materials and tools to create different textures and the depth of those textures. And then when you come through and paint them with their finish, you are going to be looking at the contrast between the high areas, which are going to be light, and the recessed areas, which are going to have dark in it. Our military guys and our... Um, Primarily the gamers, they make uses of washes and things uh, that for like mail plate um, uh, and other things where, or scales is another good one, where they are making use of washes that really fit the true term of the wash, where the wash is doing two things simultaneously. It's staying translucent on the high parts, running off of the high parts or raised areas into the lower areas where it's gathering, it becomes opaque, uh, and then it can create a natural fade between those two if it's done applied correctly. And, um, but it's wanting to be two things at once, both transparent and opaque. So if you compare that to a glaze, which just stays opaque throughout, uh, or excuse me, stays uh, translucent throughout. Kind of lost my train of thought here, I'm sorry. You derailed your train, huh? Huh? You derailed your train. <laughs> yeah, you can't. But uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the point here being is that uh, depending on that metal plate and what you want to do with it, you're making use of the contrast. And so you're building it in up front before you even put the model together. Then you're coming through and you're using your finish to create your weathering and enhance some of those effects that you built into it, um, be it graining or be it metal plates or whatever, wood graining. Um, 
So that kind of gets us through that kind of generalized area. The other thing here that you need to consider is your mediums. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is kind of geared, and a lot of the handout is geared more towards acrylics and using acrylics as a base point. But your final wa uh, washes and your final effects um, need to take into account um, exactly what it is that you're utilizing um, for your mediums, be they oils or be they uh, an enamel or if they're an acrylic, because all of them are gonna require a little bit different techniques and you need to make yourself knowledgeable to those techniques. Um, so let's focus on the actual construction mode a little bit here of the styrene and getting the styrene ready to apply things. Uh, your model really needs to have a good, clean surface. Uh, acrylics in particular tend to want to gather dust. So as you're allowing your acrylics to air dry, uh, and I say air dry versus cure dry. Cure dry is where the acrylic is totally dried for like 24 hours. Uh, an uh, air dry is just where it's kind of dry to the touch. But from the time that you apply it to the time it really gets that coat of plastic mm. over that layer, it's going to be just a dust magnet. So consider your work area and what you're doing around it while you're waiting for that to dry. If you're doing some sanding or some uh, things that might create some dirt or some dust or something, consider moving your model a little bit away. Make use of a tack cloth in between your um, various layers because dirt will settle on top of it. There's just no getting around it. And so by keeping your surface area really clean, you're going to improve the final appearance of your model. That's one of those little 29 cent tips that you just don't hear about a whole lot. Um, but before you even get into painting, and along with cleaning it, um, are gonna wanna clean your styrene. Now, I say this with some reservation. It used to be, hands down, you had to come in and get out a toothbrush, put it in some soapy water, and scrub the thing. Well, some of the newer kits, some of the newer plastics and things are getting to be done well enough that they're not coming with tons of mold release on them. So that's not going to necessarily prevent uh, your paint from sticking. I would still recommend cleaning it, but the newer, newer acrylics tend to be able to go on ahead and hold on to models well enough that paint's generally not going to flake unless you really get it thin where the molecules are having a tough time binding. But if you utilize some of the things like a, a medium binder, uh, a glaze, airbrush medium, um, some of these mediums, they are going to go through uh, acrylic binders. They're going to go through and add in that acrylic uh, binding mediums to allow the paint molecules, even though it's you've thinned it way out, to come back together and to be able to join correctly. It's when you thin out the paints highly that those molecules get spread out and they can't connect, that they can't bind chemically appropriately, and that's where you start running into problems. So, um, but if you apply it that way with the binders and things, it's probably gonna work okay on top of a, a model, a styrene model, unless you've gone through and put Vaseline on it or something like that. You know? uh, but that's being said, I would still go through, just because of the general construction process, I would go through and you know dunk it in some water, throw in some vinegar, why vinegar? That's a new one. 
vinegar is going to lightly etch that styrene and help that give something for that acrylic paint to stick to. So the light etching there will help. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can come through with a real fine sandpaper and just kind of rub it over it, and that will roughen up that surface a little bit. Um, let's talk about some of the other tools that are pretty much utilized for the cleaning uh, in prepping your styrene. Of course, uh, the good old exacto knife, you know, one seam lines and things of that nature. A jeweler's file, you guys are all familiar with that. It's good for sanding the plastic. Uh, good old pen vise, small flat paint brushes, uh, very small, soft, round brushes for applying your glues. Um, you know, and then one of the big things is use a higher quality modeling putty. We're all going to be going through, and when you're getting into some of these finer modeling techniques that you're going to be applying, any irregularities, any holes, anything is going to show up. So if you see anything like that on your model surface, go through and fix it before you even prime it. And then once you do prime your model, take a good close look at it because you're going to find any effects uh, from, or defects, I should say, from your uh, modeling skills, and you'll need to correct those prior to moving on. So don't be afraid to go in and uh, rework over your primer. Just because you primed it doesn't mean you can't go back and rework things. Um, a lot of guys have a real problem removing things from styrene sprues. And that comes through on their finished models, believe it or not. And so when you go through and remove things from the sprues, take the time to do it correctly. And I've kind of given you an outline in here, but basically you just don't go in and, and cut it, you know, off the sprue and then, you know, I've got a nub there and you kind of cut off the nub and call it good. Uh -uh. That's not, not going to cut the mustard. Um, take some time and really kind of do it correctly. One thing that I don't have on here is if you've got a real fine part, particularly if it's a longer part, um, say a, a, a brake line, um, cut both pieces of the sprue so that that brake line is just kind of hanging. Otherwise, if you try to go through and cut the sprue off uh, or cut the brake line or whatever that long piece is off, one side's going to have a lot of tension on it and the other side won't. And then when you go put in your nippers or whatever, you're going to end up stamping that half. But if you cut the actual sprue to relieve that tension, that will enable you to cut that off more cleanly and get closer to it. Um, so that's kind of about that. Um, and uh, let's see here. The next thing is uh, I had to show the... Uh, pictures, but I'm not going to go back to that because we've kind of already done that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> primers, um, primers, try to use them neat or right out of the bottles if at all possible. You may need to thin them, thin them a little bit if you're shooting them through an airbrush, um, but primers are kind of a unique character. Um, be careful if you're going through and using primers like this. Um, a lot of these things, even though they're labeled primers, they're not. They're really nothing more than gray paint. Um, so uh, always look for um, something that's really dry sanding, that's sandable. That's kind of one of the giveaways. Make sure that it's, it's not just a, a, a gray paint um, on that. So, We've gone through and used the Krylon there on some of the things that we're going to be doing here in just a bit. Um, let's talk about pre-shading undercoats, washes, and glazes. And I'm going to kind of step up the pace here. But when I say this, and this is where it gets really difficult introducing you guys to all of this stuff, a lot of these terms overlap, uh, the techniques and applications overlap. Uh, there is no one set way to apply it. I can't come in and say, first come in with a glaze, then you come in with a filter, then you're gonna come in with a glaze, and then you're gonna come in with a, 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 a 
a pen line filter. You know, I, I can't do that because how you go through construct and whether your model is going to be different, not only for the materials of the model um, and one, but styrene has a highly reflective uh, property to it. And so anything that you paint on it down below, when light comes through those layers of paint, it's going to get reflected back out. And so your underpaintings, your undercoatings, uh, your base paintings, uh, of your base coats, and then your layering, your weather layering on top of all of that, all of that is light going through, hitting that um, styrene and coming back out. And so you need to consider how that is going to affect that light coming back out. If you put on a dark undercoat, then that's going to reflect totally different than a gray print. So um, we'll cover kind of that. So when I'm talking about these in this handout here, understand that there's really no set process. It's something that you're going to learn just through experience. And to get that experience, you just got to challenge yourself and say, I want to learn how to take my weathering to the next step. That's what the military guys have done for a long time now. They just automatically take that next step. Um, we as model railroaders are still in 101, whereas they're in three to 400 level classes, okay? Um, and the only way you're gonna get up here to the three, 400 level classes is to step out of the box and try some of the other techniques. Go onto the internet, take a look at YouTube and some of the others be, and, and focus in on just a pen wash or just a filter and try to understand how to apply it. And then take two or three, you know, 29 cent practice builds like these here, these are things that I just constructed over uh, a matter of an hour out of styrene and some foam form. Um, and uh, construct yourself a few things and build them because that's all going to give you practice. Uh, but terminology wise, when I have been talking about and when I say a wash, a wash is nothing more than a thin down paint. Okay, we tend to think in the hard world as the good old ink and alcohol stains or uh, leather dye and uh, alcohol stains. Um, those are a wash in general. Anytime you're thinning something about more than one to 10, you're tending to get into a wash, all right? Um, a glaze, which uses a glazed medium, and the reason that you need to use that glazed medium in this is because the molecules of paint are starting to be drawn so far apart that they cannot chemically combine correctly. But a glaze is nothing more than a thin down wash, okay? Um, and a glaze is used to make moderations in tone, okay? Uh, so uh, if you wanted to uh, have some real highlights on a, a round area, say a bell. You could use a glaze. Another place where a glaze would be real handy is creating a dust effect on the side of a railroad car uh, or on the side of your structure. Like we saw that wood that was grayed, uh, that a glaze would work there. You could, uh, uh, a filter is nothing more than a thin down glaze. So you're getting into, you know, we're talking one to 30, one to 40 for this type of thing. And a filter, when you apply a filter, you're really doing the fine touches to a nuance. So you've gone through and you've gone and highlighted your edges on, on your uh, little structure here, okay? This styrene structure, if you look at the, now this is not totally covered over yet, uh, still real soft, but if you look real carefully and you'll have to kind of twist it, you'll see where the edges on the boards have been yeah. highlighted, but they also have a filter applied to them. 
if I had just left the highlighting on there, they would stand out and be very stark. But by taking a filter and applying the filter to the entire structure, if you will, then it blends everything together and it takes away that sharpness. But if you are kind of focusing in on it and really focus on it, you can see those white edges. When you look at that, and if I didn't bring that to your attention, you probably wouldn't notice those sharp lines on the edges. But, um, you know, consciously you would not notice that. As a modeler, you might, but the general person won't. But their eye and their mind notice it. Okay, and that picks up on it. And that's the type that they carry over to the rest of your modeling. And so this is why it's useful to create a few models where you take it to that effect because it goes through and shows that effect all the way through. Um, the uh, other thing is, is that piece had a few other techniques on it. The weathering there, if you notice on the inside of the boards outlining the structure are colored kind of gray. The outside is colored kind of that buff sand color. That's because I used two different uh, techniques of dry brushing. Uh, one of them was an outside stroke going in and a stiffer brush. And then on the inside, I use a softer brush going only from the inside out. So basically across the entire boards. And so I got two different colors. But prior to doing the dry brushing, I went through and I used a pin wash, which is where I applied a wash to the underside of all of the boards going around into those seams, much like the military modelers use yeah. in a uh, aircraft, okay? Um, and I don't know if you noticed it, but if you'll think about it, you notice that the black and stuff was kind of feathered in and, and, and coming out. Mm -hmm. That's part of the pin wash technique. You apply the pin wash, and then you go in and clean it up a little bit. But in the process of that cleaning, you're also feathering. And, and so it feathers it out and makes it much softer uh, to explore and interact with. Go on ahead and throw it, it's okay. Um, so, um, if you need to use a toothpick or as a handle, I use these type of things. Um, I also oftentimes will go through and I lost it. I know I've got a handle here, but uh, I use a little, here it is, piece of wooden dowel, put a hole in, and I can take my toothpicks, and instead of making my fingers tired with this after a couple hours, put it in, put them into something like this, and it keeps my hands from getting really tired. Okay, uh, just 29 cents, but you know, as we get older, our hands get tired of holding stuff all the time that's really small. Um, primers, we've already talked about Always apply your layers very thinly. Um, use um, your under colorings and your primers to your advantage. Um, let's talk about a, a tank car as an example or a metal tank. If you come through and prime it with a white or a gray primer, you're going to have one effect when you paint that metal or color over it, say the aluminum or the steel. Okay, light's going to come through; it's going to hit that lighter colored surface and come back out. How's a mirror made? They paint a dark, almost black, on the back of it. Okay, so why not create a mirror? And then come through and apply glazes over that mirror and give you much more control over your reflective coat. And it'll, because it is so highly reflective, it'll allow you to kind of uh, enjoy the weathering effects a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, use a primer. This is styrene, and this is a gloss black primer. And we'll use this uh, here to create some wood in just a moment. If you wanted to, you could also go through and use inks. Um, there's dark colored inks and things of that nature. Inks will also work and 
in this application. Um, my point is use something dark and you're going to in increase your reflective index uh, through the layers of the base color as well as your final varnish uh, to make it more silvery. Um, if you're doing stuff, consider paints like smoke. Smoke's got a brown tint to it. When you feather that out highly, you're going to be getting into the yellows and some of the oranges potentially. And that will help the blending for something like your rust effects. Uh, it'll also uh, help if you're doing woods because it'll make the, the wood appear much more lively. Um, Iraqi sand, horrible name for us, but uh, as, as non-military guys. But that buff color, that's what's been used on the edges there. So that works really well. Uh, think about your coloring that you're going through and uh, doing your shading up front. Your xenthan all uh, highlighting, which I discussed earlier, is actually done up front before you actually start your base coat. And basically, all that is is it's a fancy term for really focusing on, on your light indexes. So things like that barrel. What you do is you have your model here, and you'll come through and you'll paint it a dark color, okay? Typically a brown, dark gray, uh, brown black, okay? And you prime it, the whole model in that color. Just go through and you prime it. Xanthanol coloring, by the way, pretty much only works with an airbrush, but um, you can do it with a brush, but it's a little bit more tricky. So you come down. Chris, and, hold, hold it still so Gary can focus. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. I didn't realize you were trying to do this. Yeah, actually, uh, if, I'll if, put if it you down just, here. Yeah, there you uh, go. So, sorry. <laughs> here, you want to follow this? Follow this. Um, okay. So, but basically, it's got your your point of light coming down. So you come through and color your entire model a dark gray black. Okay. Then you take um, a spray coat, and this is going to be a medium uh, gray, and you come through and you spray it, the model, from all the way around from like a 45 degree angle. All right? So that's pretty much the, head, the, the general coloring of the models. Um, and then you come, or excuse me, the gray coat, and this is all underlining. And then you come through and put it with a lighter gray straight down from the top. So that's going to give you your highlighting, your lighting coming down from the top. So for the barrel, that's going to give you the dark underside, the middle, and then in this case, it'll give you kind of a highlighting more like this. But um, if you didn't want something real heavy and you were after something in the shadow, you may go real light on that top. Um, then you'd come through and from a 45 degree angle, shoot onto the model, okay? And that's gonna give you your base colors. And then after you're, you get done, you're gonna find that you've got natural shading in there, just right off the bat. And you may not even wanna take it that much further. But then you can come through and add highlights and a glaze. And if you're a little bit hesitant about it, you may wanna apply a, a filter uh, to apply uh, some additional weathering there to it, be it the dust, be it the uh, rain effects or whatever, but um, water running down the side of your building, whatever. The, the point is that that under shading will create all of the shadows for you right up front. Um, you can then get into using, as I said, uh, the various types of filters uh, and washes. And I kind of just went through here and listed them. We, as model railroaders, just tend to use wash in its most general sense. And that's where we're going through and just slapping on that old alcohol, black ink wash, and we just flood everything with it. And when we get done, we have all sorts of little marks. They're called tide pools. Well, we don't typically clean those up. 
You do need to clean them up. Your model will look much better. When you're in the process of cleaning those up with a little bit of uh, um, alcohol or whatever, you'll get uh, some natural feathering effects. Uh, you can use target washes where you're applying it just to a, a given area. Uh, you can use target washes underneath your base coats. Uh, you can use the filters uh, to change the uh, overall color of the models as well as cheap blending in your highlights. Uh, there's different types of filters. Uh, one of the good ones is a dot filter. You, that's where you go through and you apply very, very small dots of paint. I typically, in HO scale, will use the tip of a toothpick and just apply small dots of oil paints uh, going through there. And then you come through and use your uh, turps and do a downstroke only, and you'll get your weathering downstrokes coming through. Uh, another good thing would be the bust around a barrel or something, nail heads. Uh, you can do some of those. and. Uh, uh, create that effect. Um, uh, we've got the targeted washes, the dot washes. Um, you basically, though, uh, when you go to try to do some of your uh, filter effects in acrylics, always try to use water as a medium. Don't use your thinners, your acrylic thinners. Uh, the reason being is the acrylic thinners will tend to thin the paint and slow it down on its drying and it makes it a little bit more so that instead of getting a streak it blends out and so you want that more defined streaking type thing. Uh, painting bricks and things uh, a good thing would be to come through and use a wash technique and then you can come through and just block that wash real quick and that will uh, color the bricks. Uh, you can also use a, a different technique of coming in with a side almost parallel to the bricks and paint it and color it that way. Um, and then you can use other techniques going through and picking out bricks, brick by brick, uh, to really add some final coloring techniques to, or colors, different hues to the bricks or stones. Um, pastels, I'm going to just cover real briefly here a couple of things that people don't tend to think about with the pastels is that they are not, I know we call them chocks, they are not chocks. Chocks are made out of gypsum or limestone. They're basically colored from seven different pigments. Um, they are oven dried. They are highly compressed, um, you know, machine compressed. Uh, they just basically don't work for modeling purposes. Pastels, on the other hand, are actual true earth pigments. There's what are, they're the pigments in this paint, they're the pigments in oil paints, they're the pigments in weathering powders. Um, all they are are just the pigments combined with some binders. Now there's different volumes of binders that are used by the manufacturers. Uh, and that's going to give them a different property. If there's very little binders, they're very, very crumbly. If there's a little bit more binders, they're a little bit uh, more chunky. And that comes in handy for us when we're going through and doing our weathering. If we have one type of pastel, say a selenier, that is very, very soft, when we grow to scrape it, we're going to get a fine powder. Uh, if we go and use a different brand, and when we go through and scrape them, we're going to get a fine powder and some chunks. When you go to apply those to the model, you pull down with your uh, solvents, you're going to get heavy streaks versus a light tonal variation. So you can use different manufacturers' pastels to our advantage in our hobby. And you just have to kind of experiment, find out which pastels you like to use for whatever uh, techniques you like to use. They're just most commonly used. People just take them, scrape them, uh, and then they will, or they grind them in a coffee grinder or something, and then they will go through and apply them 
and you apply a solvent to it. Now again, because pastels do not have any binders, they don't tend to stick, okay? Uh, so we'll talk about that more in just a moment here. But returning back to the pastels, you've got soft pastels, you've then got what's called an oil. They require solvents. You've got pan pastels, which are basically pastels with very little binder, but they've been lightly compressed into a container. They're great for using, uh, creating glaze effects, basically. Uh, so dusting effects like uh, a dusty side of a car or a dusty, uh, you want to some peeling paint, but you also want that paint to kind of look chalk. You go through and uh, apply uh, some dust. Um, you've got the pencil pastels if you need to do some fading or some fine lines, uh, some uh, soft pencil pastels. Soft pencil pastels are different from your colored pencils, like Pantene colored pencils. Those are totally different animals. Um, You've also got what's called the weathering powders, Bragdon and those guys. Those are nothing more than either ground up pastels or earth pigments that have some dry adhesive that's been applied to the mix. The dry adhesive is typically pressure sensitive adhesive. So what it, the advantage of using weathering powders is that because the chalk or Pastel tends to not bind to surfaces, and styrene and pastels hate one another. <laughs> uh, what it tends to do is give a little bit of a adhesive so that that, dust, that dusting powder does not come off as easy. Uh, that works for us in the handling of our models, rolling stock. Um, it can also be an advantage to things like um, you know, the airflow over your rolling stock. The downside of it, eh, well, if I get a little bit too much here or there, it's really, really hard to remove. And it doesn't want to come off as easy. So you've got a trade off here. Um, pastels, regular soft pastels, you can put them on. If you don't like them, they come right off until you actually set them on there. Setting a pastel on your models is a whole different ball of wax. People got into it and they started pastels and okay, get out my you know can of clear coat, start spraying away dull coat, and their pastel is gone. You know, it's like well, the varnishes and stuff take up those pastels. So you gotta be really careful. Now you can actually use that to your advantage, um, like an HO scale, it's ideal. You can't, some of that dull coat, or you can actually buy the dull coat in a bottle. You know, most people don't know that. But, um, and then get that into a, a brush, into a little bit of a, your liquid dull coat, then into the powder, like I use a rust powder mix, and then stipple it onto, say, a smokestack or something. Um, doorknobs, whatever, and it'll give, when it dries, a really crusty, textured effect. And in HO scale, you can actually see that textured effect. And uh, it's it's really, really handy. Uh, you can paint it on smoother uh, to apply it to things like hinges and stuff like that in HO scale. Um, so that kind of is, is a view on the uh, pastels. Um, craft versus uh, artist pastels. I've got some craft pastels. Um, these will work for most model railroaders, but if you really want to get into a better quality pastel, if you're planning on your models going about 10 years or longer without color changes, get into the fine art pastels. Uh, and uh, you can go to any fine art store or online to Dick Blick and buy fine art pastels. And you're going to find that they are of a higher quality pigments. They've got a higher quality binders in them. They've got, um, uh, they, they scrape or chip a lot easier. Uh, 
and they just have brighter hues, so you'll get much richer colors with them. Uh, and then the only other thing is uh, that I'd like to throw out on this before I get into a couple of real quick little demos um, is, and I've got to say this with a caveat because I'm still playing with it and I'm still researching it. But I'm finding at this point in time to bind pastels to a styrene substrate that is not highly weathered. Um, where is it here? I know I brought it. Um, um, yeah, okay. Uh, this is just nothing more than a hunk of styrene that has some pastels applied to it, but I bound them with um, some decal set. And you have to make sure that you're using set, not the softening solution, you know, the setting solution. One of them softens the decal, one of them sets it. Setting it has binders in it. Those binders appear to work really well with pastels. Um, and so I'll show you that here in just a moment. We'll go through and paint something with pastels. But here's something that's been dry. And I might say that this has already gone through about 20 hands. So this pastel, you can rub it and you can see that it's basically not coming off. And uh, I'm still experimenting with it. Uh, there's some issues with some light fastness and stuff that may become an apparent, but uh, so far I haven't uh, really identified that. Another thing that you can use to help bind pastels is inks. Uh, there's acrylic inks and you can apply some acrylic inks as a base color. Um, this is an acrylic ink over um, uh, this base coat of Rust-Oleum. Beige. Point in front and, of the camera, Jim. Okay. So this is the uh, base coat. I kind of think of you guys out here. I forget about him. Sorry, folks. Uh, so, but this is an ink, an acrylic ink over a rust oleum uh, base coat. And what you can see is that um, this ink left just the surfaces. It didn't, unless I really over applied it. I didn't get uh, anything really dark, but basically it left all of the darker grooves. So it, that's a natural shadowing effect uh, that you can get on your weathering. And by using a stippling motion and a pulling down motion, you can kind of get different values of the ink coloring. Use that as your base coat, and while it's still tacky, come back in with some chalks over it and uh, you can get those to stick. You may need to apply a little bit of solvent on top of that, help those chocks flow a little bit. But uh, here's one, and this has been uh, basically applied the same way. This is just uh, uh, a little bit lighter overcoat, but this time it's an ink over an acrylic base coat, just a, an acrylic uh, paint using that as my primer. Um, so, but you can see between the two here, the value differences of how that ink is reflecting uh, the undercolor coating. Okay, um, so let's talk real quick about um, applications. Here, um, I'm going to go through and set this up real quick if you guys can get out of here. Now let's talk real quick about bricks because bricks are one of those animals. There's 8 million ways to attack the bricks, but I'm going to show you two of my favorite ways to do it. Number one is to come through and create a kind of almost a wash. Um, and I'm just going to use a basic uh, brick color and this is an acrylic paint. And I'm just using a, uh, a CAD 
uh, I'll use a, a, a red leather, excuse me. That'll show up a little bit better here. And so what I've done is I've gone through this, just some vinyl bricks that you might get in a kit. And um, so I've just gone through and primed them with the good old Rust-Oleum over here. Yep. And I'm just going to make this up real quick. You primed both sides? No, just okay. one side. Yeah. Is that a Vallejo? Yeah, it's a Vallejo paint, um, but I did not shake it well enough, quite frankly. So it's going to be a little bit lighter in color than I really want. And I'm going to grab, thin it down just a little bit, and that's what I forgot. I knew I was going to get something, and of course I forgot my dropper. I'm going to take a, a relatively small brush here and apply some drops. I'm mixing this with about a 50-50 What are you mixing it with? Just straight water. Normally I go through and will not do this, but I'm going to do it for the sake of time here. And I'm just going to come through here and use my paintbrush to mix it up. And so what you're after, I don't know if you can see it, this is a little bit thick for a wash. Or um, you can see how it kind of flows down, but it's still pretty thick when it's at the top up here. So um, if I come through, but that's, a, that's about the consistency of a wash right there. So kind of milk, and I'm going to kind of get most of it off my brush. <coughs> Excuse me. And then holding my brush, normally this is done flat. Holding my brush kind of flat, as parallel to the surface as possible. I'm going to come through and then just lightly stroke down. Okay, in one direction only across the face of the bricks. There I got it too wet, so got some in the mortar lines, but I think you can see the effect that you get here as you go through it. And you may have to do it a couple of times get your colors but as long as you don't get too much paint on your brush you where you will experience this um, you can use this method of coloring the bricks and leaving your mortar lines and so um, unfortunately color is not quite coming through as strong as i wanted it but this is one way to create that that effect I think everybody gets the general idea here. If you get something like this down here, there is a way that you can fix it. You would have let it dry and then apply a wash. And the way that you can apply the wash effect is if we go through and grab, you know, I had another piece here. Wash. And you guys probably can't see this. This is some more brick. There is brick on this. It's HO scale brick. I'll pass this around real quick while I'm prepping my wash. So you can see the very fine brick detail in that. I'd hate to go through and try to paint the bricks and using larger brushes like this is a little bit difficult on something that small. So I would tend to go through and create a wash and I would use a white just a slightly gray white wash. For our purposes, I'm going to use a brown white wash. This is uh, just a white flesh color. In Vallejo paints with pocket acrylics. And 
And again, I'm mixing it up so that this one, I'm gonna do about an eight to one ratio. Excuse me, an eight, yeah, about eight to one. So I'm making much closer to what would be called a glaze. Glazes, again, can be used to change tonal colors uh, as well as blending. And normally with a glaze, you're going to add a little bit of glaze medium. But here I don't have, uh, because I'm just coming in, I'm not going to add the glaze medium. The glaze medium would make it flow out more, but I want it to flow in this particular case from the higher surfaces to the lower crevices. So this is what I mean. You've got to consider what it is that you're doing. And so with this one, what we'll do here is I come in. It's so hard to see. Make sure I'm on the right side. <laughs> it will wave without the visor. You just come in and um, um, you can apply it straight, which is one way, and it'll flow into the areas here and give you your colors in the mortar lines. Excess, just go through and dab up. Now, if you have to come through and color this prior, uh, like I chose this red just because it was easy. If I was to color this thing a different color, then I would apply a barrier of some sort, bulk coat or something, prior to doing this wash. Otherwise, you're going to get just a mishmash of colors over time. But you can kind of see what's going on here. Now, the problem that I don't like about this is that you have a wash still on the faces of the brick. So uh, to give it a little bit more definition, come through and dab it. That one dab it too hard. So normally I allow it to sit for about three minutes, four minutes before I apply it. Just hoping to get some other contrast. And I'm using a stippling motion here to apply this wash. But this will give you kind of an older brick type thing because uh, some of the color will uh, basically be a filter to sit on top of the bricks and kind of color that basically. Just kind of coming through. Lightly dab it here. Another towel. I brought a texture towel instead of a t shirt rag. T shirt rag works the best for this. But I don't know if you can see that or not. But it really needs one more layer. But you would get the uh, coloring effect in here, and everybody can kind of see what I'm doing here. And depending on the effect that you're after, you can either kind of let it sit. With this type of uh, a coloring, where you've got it more highlighted here, after about three or four minutes, come through and dab it, and you won't pull as much out. Um, or you can dab it immediately and get um, kind of a different effect. My point is play with these techniques a little bit, and you'll see that you can get. Uh, new brick or older brick, uh, just with uh, a difference in techniques. Um, let's also talk briefly about 
uh, to pastels and using a pastel real quick to color styrene. Um, I've got a hunk of styrene here. Where's my big hunk? Lost my big hunk of styrene. Where to go to? So it's like inside there. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. It's hiding from you. Okay. Um, got a hunk of styrene here. Again, I primed it, held it in the corner with my thumb. So um, what we can do is we can use some chalks, pastels more correctly. So if you want to go with railroad vernacular chalks. And I'm just going to go through and try a few real quick. Now, if you're scraping these, you can um, use an exacto or something to scrape them. Um, for this case, I didn't want to carry around an exacto blade, so I just got a, a little uh, green sponge. I think. And I'm going to come in and put down some of these colors. Now, when you're weathering on this, you're going to go from light to dark, not dark to light. Uh, that's a, a thing that a lot of people tend to not understand. Um, it's easy to darken something, but it's very difficult to lighten something. So, and when you're weathering. So, I'm going to start off with some of the lighter colors here. And I'm just going to give myself some, and get it on. I'm just putting it on this, and then I'm kind of rubbing it. Jerry's going to shoot me because I'm getting this on this table for <laughs> Okay. And then I'm going to come through with a little bit of a different tone. Now I got a yellow brown tone on there, so I'm going to kind of go heavy in the browns a little bit with this. And by randomly applying this, okay, I kind of get that. Now, I'm going to add just a bit of, because um, I want to show this as aged wood. I'm kind of going after, if you will recall, the middle board here that was kind of like this board here. It's kind of where I'm headed with it. So I don't know. There you go. <laughs> There I is. Okay. Um, I'm kind of going after this board right here. Create a little bit of a fade effect on like this board. So that's what I'm kind of going after a little bit. So like I said, always know where you're wanting to go a little bit with it. And I'm going to add just a little bit of a gray here. And now I'm going to switch to a small scrape bristle cut short of your brush and I'm going to brush some of my pastel on that and I'm going to come through and add a few highlights to this thing. Now it doesn't look like much right now but if I add my solvent here I'm going to use a fan brush in this Particular case. And the solvent is. This is the diasol. The salt and set. Yeah, the salt set. Okay, set. Gotcha. And it's my solvent for this. And I'm going to just 
lightly drag it down. I'm going with the grain of the wood. Notice that I dipped it in here and I did not go straight. I kind of dabbed it off a little bit. And add that a little bit more pastel to it. I'm going to get aggressive here for a little bit. For a little bit. Yep. And the nice thing about pastels, you can't go wrong. And I'll just throw on a couple of highlights here. And hand brush again. And then we'll see where we're at. And again, I noticed I dabbed off the fan brush prior to application. Okay, now we're starting to, starting to get there. As I said, always do things in layers. Sneak up on what you're after. If you apply a straight wash to it, you'll end up washing it right off. That's what I wanted to show you with that quarter. Um, so you do have time to kind of interact. I'm sorry, Jerry. You do have time to interact with it. Um, <clears throat> if you do it fairly quickly, you can totally remove it, even with the solvent. But as soon as this sets, it's going to set to pretty much just what we had over there. If you guys want to go just a couple more minutes, I'll run through coloring um, a uh, my other box here. This box with acrylics. Are you guys interested in seeing that? Because mm -hmm. I can go through and do that real quick here. Give me just a second. Sorry, I'm running just about 10 minutes over. Um, one thing I will say right now, if you go through and really research the military guys and the gamers and compare them to us, what you'll find is that in general, the military folks and the gaming and figure painters are doing, primarily gaming and military, they're doing their base coats in acrylics. And then their washes and everything, they're using enamels. And so you alternate between enamels and washes, or excuse me, acrylics, back and forth to gain six or seven layers. And uh, so what you've got, if you notice, is I've got an ink. And this is a, um, a Vallejo product. So I can use the inks as a base or anywhere for tonals. These remain inks remain extremely transparent. So they're great for blending and for tonal quality changes. Uh, of course, your regular paints are opaque, but your filters, like this is a filter, and then this is a wash, but both of these products, you can use kind of like acrylics, but they're enamel, okay? Your solvent, you do have to use terps and things like that. They have a smell compared to the, the other things, and they smell wretched. But they work totally different uh, in respect 
over the acrylics than an acrylic wash would work. That being said, I can't tell you exactly how it will affect you. You're going to have to go in and play with it a bit. For me, it has to do with how they cool and how they flow from higher recesses to lower recesses. So if I wanted to take uh, a wash here, the wash is generally applied right out of the bottle. And if you've got a wash product, otherwise you can dilute it down. If you're using an oil paint to make a wash, make sure to start setting it up about three hours beforehand. Put a dab of oil paint on a piece of cardboard and let it sit there. The reason being is you want the linseed oil uh, to leach out of that pigment so that when you go to apply it, the pigment doesn't thin way out and that slows down the drying time, further increasing how it layers and thins out. Okay, that's how you can get some fairly smooth strokes with it. Um, but that's not what you want in this particular case, so you would thin it out. Um, but if I wanted to apply a wash to this, I would go through here and just kind of paint it up and take my wash and apply it directly to the model. And this looks pretty dark for wood. Now, the thing about the acrylics and styrene that I've learned over time is that I can sit there for six, seven hours and watch the paint dry. And the sucker will not change colors for me. So what you apply and what you see here, other than the gloss factor, is pretty much the colors you're going to get. Um, so if you want to thin it down a little bit, you have to do so at this point in the game. Now there's multiple ways you can do that. You can come through and you can do it with um, your solvents. Oh, they've got some troops sitting around here. Don't worry. And so I'm taking a brush that I've just dipped into the turpentine. I've dried it off a little bit. And then I'm going to pull it over this. And I can change and wipe off the excess here that I've pulled. And I can change my tonal qualities on this. And if I do it nice and smooth, I'm wiping off the excess that I'm pulling off. I can introduce all sorts of various tonal qualities. Okay. And I'm going to put that over here to kind of dry for a few moments. And then if we want to go back to the straight acrylics, let me bottle this thing up so it doesn't stink the high heaven. My point being is that with the enamels, that you can treat them just like the acrylics. If you use wash products, you tend to use them neat right out of the bottles here. Um, you can thin them down, but if you start getting into the thinning of it, uh, use the manufacturer's thinner, particularly with Vallejo. I've got some recipes for regular thinners if you want to let me know. But um, for the, uh, the enamels and things, use your turps or your cellulose uh, thinners. But this, as it dries, will give us a little bit of different tonal qualities. Going into using um, the acrylics. Uh, you can go through and buy acrylic sets like these. Um, these are AK Interactive. Um, the difference between volume one and volume two 
is that this one's for warm wood, this one's for cool woods. So depending on the effect that you're, uh, if I wanted to go through and I go, went through and primed this real quick, so I'm just gonna take, and we'll just use a couple of different colors here. I'll just use a different palette. I'm gonna use um, a medium brown. And light gray. Are you guys all familiar with dry brushing? If I say dry brushing, everybody knows that technique. Use a light gray. So, I'm And um, one thing I did not show you, because I've been waiting for the bricks to kind of dry, but um, was the use of those ink pens, but I think you guys understand the ideas behind that. So just using three basic colors here, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna kind of start with my lightest color. Um, and a little bit of watering hand here, so I've got something to dip with. Get a little bit of paint off of my uh, brush. Now I'm just going to come through and apply the paint. I'll do a couple of faces on this thing. You guys can kind of see it up quick. Notice how when I'm going through and doing this, some of the paint is building up in the edges here. So I'm going to pull that back out because I don't want that acrylic. That's kind of a U shape, but it's not a, in this case, it's a square because I built it. But normally in, in your kits and stuff, that's going to be more of a U. And so you don't necessarily want that paint hanging in there. And when the paint starts to become tacky, Stop using it. Stop painting. Stop at that point. So I applied it to a couple of different faces here. Okay, bingo. Get out the magic candy dandy. And normally I allow about three to five minutes in between layers to air dry. But you can speed it up this way. It does um, make the application a little bit more soft because the styrene tends to retain the heat. Next, I'm gonna grab a, a little different brush Bad brush technique, don't let your brushes sit in anything heads down like that is. It's going to shoot me when I get home. And this one I thin down a little bit more and I'm applying it. Um, and if you'll notice, um, I'm just kind of getting um, that too much on there. I'm using more almost a, a glazed. It's not a, it's not quite a wash. And I'm allowing this one to kind of get in the crevices. The reason for that is I want to come back in and do some blending in kind of the next step here. And I'm going to grab a little bit of this. And go up and down with my following the grain lines of the wood. Okay, bingo. Get out the handy dandy. 
Next, I'm going to apply a quick um, darker paint um, as a wash. To get something up in those lines, and then I'm going to come back and kind of do a uh, brown filter on it, which will give me a, a little bit of a that brown brown will move it from being this cold wood to more of a warmer wood, and then I'll finally use a, a white filter of the red which will give us that red tone kind of approximate what we had in that one board across this thing with some lighter wood tones underneath. So again, we need to create a, a real quick uh, dark wash. This is a primer. That's not what I wanted. That's the wood. Um, You use the wood washer. It's the black that I wanted over there. So I was going to pick it up here at the shop. It did not have it in right now. So I'm going to use a over here, and I'm just going to pull this right out of the top. And then I'm going to go through and apply it. Around now here, if you'll notice, what I'm getting is kind of the um, filter to um, it's kind of blowing up on me here. Uh, it's just the wood's hot. Starting to start warm. This is giving me that filter. And a, a, a better way of doing this, quite frankly, and I can't do it because I'm doing this real quick, is to come in with just a little bit of your water or a, a hairbrush thinner and lay down just a thin, like just a damp layer. And then it'll help it flow into the corners better. Okay, so now I'm going to use my uh, kind of a chisel brush and I'm going to show you how to kind of get it out of there. I'm using just a thinner and I'm going to come in and do my blending. And in this case, I'm trying to go with the wood. I'm trying to get rid of the sharp colors. Heat and the styrene makes this a little bit difficult. So it wants to dry a little bit faster. I'm going to grab some acrylic thinner. Now you can kind of see how this is starting to uh, a little bit. This and just styrene is just flat out right to the hot one. I applied it. I'm not going to get any sorry I can't have a failure or something. A little bit of 
this out of this one. <coughs> got some weathering on that one. So I've got a dark, dark side, a light side is what we got going. I'm going to dry this real quick. And let's get a quasi dry. Now, normally, I would take a little bit more time, give it about five minutes in between coats, and it works a lot more effectively than what I'm doing right now. And finally, I'm going to come back in with the red here. This is a soft brush. This is probably red with this brown. I'm making a Again, a little bit of a wash with this. And this world is kind of hard to. The point is that you can kind of see on, on this one. Kind of got a little bit of paint gathered in here along and some up above, but it's most of it is down on the bottom. On the light side, where I feathered it a little bit, it's been feathered in to create more of a dirty type of wood. So this is going to be closer to what we're after than this side. This side's going to have a, in the middle, it'll have that red hue. We'll try to capture it. So I'm going to take a soft brush again, fairly large, apply the acrylic with a uh, stippling motion to initially apply it, and then I'll come back and kind of brush paint it a little bit uh, once it's kind of tacky. And if you notice, it's kind of wet, and kind of got it flowing, it's still kind of a wash, okay? See how that's flowing down? So, and I'm gonna kind of work it just a bit while it's still tacky, or it gets to a tacky state. That's gonna give me that blaze, if you will, this particular case. And I'm going to pull just a little bit more out of where it's gathering in the seam, more like a wash. So it is a wash, so it's acting like a wash. Let's think about it here a little bit. Pull it up. Make it tacky. I'm just trying to spread it out. And one more time, add it with a uh, 
It's a wash again, so I'm going to dry off my brush, come in and pull it out of the place where it's acting like a wash, and kind of clean it down. Now, with a glaze, you want it to stay where you apply it. So like in here, uh, even though it's going to be kind of heavy here, it's staying where I applied it, which is what I want. Um, that's kind of uh, in the technique, what I'm after here is that in a wash, you kind of flood a little bit. In a glaze and stuff, you put on a thin coat. So paint basically stays where you applied it. Okay. Everything is sticky. Come on. And I'll pass this around a little bit here in just a moment. <laughs> what I didn't quite get the entire color. Now the other thing is it's going to dry kind of in a semi-gloss state. So I still need to come back and apply some dull coat or something to it. Gonna to touch this up here real quick and dry it real quick. Kind of pass around. I'm gonna to try to get this to apply through this middle section. This would be a targeted type of glaze because you want a targeted filter. So what I'm trying to do here is just change the tonal values a little bit. And again, note that the uh, paint or pigments are staying where they're applied. I'm my toothpick holder. It's burning my fingers. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There was a reason I brought these. It's kind of hard to see in this light. But I'm going to pass this around. This will give you kind of a little bit of a clue on what's going on. But you can see the, the start of all of this. And with that, I'll ask if there's any questions. Times a pin wash. A pin wash, yeah. Um, a pin wash is a wash that is applied, say you're not both washers. Okay. Okay. You come in. And no, well, nobody first signed of all, it. you're going to go through with a solvent yeah, and lightly it. apply. Oh, so it's well, just that must be an extra one. Maybe that's his. Your bolts. Then you'll come in and touch each bolt with that A and I. We would call it an A and I wash, but it's it's actually a, 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 a very thin wash. It's going to tend to flow in and flow around that seam, create that yeah you know, opaque. Brown shadow, brown black shadow. Okay, then where you've got a little bit of overflow, um, you're going to let it dry 10 minutes or so. But before it's fully cure dry, is the trick. Um, you're going to take some solvent on a 
a stiffer brush, I tend to use a, a chisel or a flat to come in and, and clean up any excess that you've got sticking out. And in the process of also kind of cleaning that up, it's going to feather that out. It's very, very subtle. But what it will do is enhance um, and until you actually do it, it's hard to explain. But it's kind of a light touch, but kind of doing that light touch and reactivating the paint a little bit there, your watch a little bit, and it'll feather a little bit, as well as leaving a, a more definitive line. And so that's really what a pin wash is. In the military world, they call them panel lines. Uh, also, oh, okay. uh, yeah, panel seam, lines. And, seam reference. Yeah, that. seams, things of that nature. In our world, um, things like around a, a stock car with the metal bracing, okay, any of those metal braces, in any place you're trying to create shadow, or underneath a uh, hangers for the door hangers. Mm -hmm. um, another good place on a, a structure is around down pipes, uh, down spouts, um, eaves, edges, things, uh, things of that nature. Okay, that kind of answer yeah. question. Anything else? The best way to say, you touched on it briefly, but the best way to like uh, preserve weathering powders, so like you hit it with salt, but it disappears. And right. Have tons of that problem. Now I'm reluctant to even do anything at all other than just weather it and set it and forget it. Uh -huh. um, I'm worried about people that do modulars and they pick these things up, you know, and they're like, oh, could you go to it? I'm really scared to. Yeah. No, that's why I'm yeah. saying you can. Depending on the techniques that you're using, you can use uh, something like a uh, acrylic medium to help set it, but those tend to be a little bit tricky to use. Uh, so that's why I've been experimenting with something thinner that will act as a carrier and get them down into the grooves as well as not obliterate the grooves. That's the trick. Uh, because you want your other washes and things to reflect those shadows. You don't want your wash totally obliterating all of that. And so that's why I'm saying the uh, decal uh, solvent setting solution here um, is uh, actually turning out to be very, very effective uh, for setting the pastels without really affecting the colors of the pastels. Now, pastels, unlike acrylics, when you apply any moisture to them, they're gonna get 18 dozen hues darker. And you can sit there and literally watch them brighten up and come back to life as the uh, solvent uh, evaporates. But you felt it and it doesn't come off in your fingers and everything. And so far, it's been through about 25 people handling it, and I haven't seen anything really come off when I applied it. And those were just a bunch of pastels applied, just like we did here. Just a little so bit more effective. Through a hairbrush for like a large, like a building, you know what I mean? Say like a large coal mine or something like that, where you weathered it top to bottom. You know, it's kind of a larger application when you say run that through an airbrush to no i would not run pastels through an airbrush no, about this so salt this i would actually as i'm applying my pastels i would apply this with the as solvent right as you're applying them okay. just like i showed you here and allow it to dry uh and as i wanted to show a little bit and i think i did you can come back and Modify your colors. You can blend it a little bit. You'll just have to play with them. Um, and the trick, though, is contrast. And remembering that you're going from dark to light, uh, and that that's you know that contrast of the dark to the light, where you've got them concentrated being dark or more opaque, and moving it to more of a light, thinner. Um, Basically, the pigment powders, the particles are not as close, so they're either condensed or they're farther apart. And that's just something that a light touch with a brush will teach you how to manipulate that. Because with this stuff, 
you want it to get, there's a stage where it's kind of tacky fairly quickly. Uh, and you'll feel that pull on the brush. And you'll have to work with that and experience it. Uh, but once you do, you'll catch on very quickly. And it's kind of like riding a bicycle. Once you get the basics to it, then you can start doing the one wheel bicycle, holding it up, <laughs> you know, advance with it. And you'll start playing with it and really advance quickly with it. Pastels, however, do not be afraid of using them. They are probably the best and easiest to use weathering tool out there. And uh, it's just a matter of, in our world, finding something that will make them stick without getting that real powdery, chalky effect. And that's where this stuff is coming in fairly effective. It doesn't leave that chalky effect, chalky dry effect. You can use them over work, over uh, some of this, if you put down a real matte surface uh, and then come back with your pastels, you'll get that real light chalky effect. So that's one way of creating it. Uh, just depends on what you're after. That's it. Chris, I, thank you I, very I much. I apologize for running away. That's part of it. One, one thing I might throw out uh, since we're talking uh, styrene and, and, and plastic and plastic modelers. There's an organization called the International Plastic uh, Modelers 